Tonight, from our national vaccine bungle to calls for an apology from the PM and our complicated relationship with China. Welcome to Q&A. Welcome to the program. Joining me on the panel tonight, journalist and researcher Vicky Shu, the new chair of Parliament's powerful Intelligence and Security Committee, James Patterson, president of the Australia-China Business Council, David Olson, the shadow minister for finance, Katie Gallagher, and Coronacast host, Dr Norman Swan. Please make all of them feel welcome. Now, you can stream us live on iView and all the socials. As always, you can join the conversation on Instagram and Twitter. Quanda is the hashtag. Please do keep it respectful. Our first question tonight comes from Helen Graham. With the information that tens of millions of dollars were paid in bonuses to Australian public servants during the same period the Australian Post team received their watches, why can't Scott Morrison just man up and apologise to Christine Holgate? He would gain more respect if he did. Senator Patterson. I've got a lot of empathy uh, for Christine Holgate because going through what she went through, being in the eye of a media storm, is a horrible thing to experience. And I have a bit of a different perspective to you, though, on the Prime Minister's involvement because four years ago I was the Parliamentary Committee Chair that revealed uh, her predecessor as Australia Post CEO, Ahmed Fahour's salary. Uh, it was a pretty horrible time for him too. Um, and I did so because I thought it was an important principle of transparency, that taxpayers are entitled to know what the senior executives at a public entity are paid. He was on the front page of newspapers and it ultimately led to his early retirement from that role. Now, at the time, no one said it was a gendered criticism because he was a man, and I don't remember anyone saying it was bullying either. They just thought it was appropriate scrutiny for a, a public servant, effectively. And I think the same is the case for, for Christine Holgate. I think it was inappropriate expenditure of taxpayers' money to hand out luxury watches to already very well-paid people. And I was also concerned to hear Christine Holgate say before the Senate committee that she wasn't spending taxpayers' money. Australia Post was established by taxpayers, uh, it has been legislated by taxpayers, it is owned by taxpayers, and every dollar of profit that it earns is remitted to taxpayers. So if they're spending it on luxury watches, that's money that doesn't go to taxpayers. And four years into her reign as CEO, that she didn't understand <laughs> what comes with running a public entity was of concern to me. But let's just be clear, she's not asking for an apology because of the scrutiny, she's asking for an apology because of the way the Prime Minister treated her on the floor of the Parliament. It's a very different thing. Well, I, I don't actually think it is that different, Hamish. I think the Prime Minister was reflecting the frustration that a lot of Australians would hear when they heard that already very highly paid public servants were further awarding themselves with taxpayers' money with expensive watches that most Australian taxpayers would never be able to afford to buy themselves. Um, if you make decisions like so, that... So it's OK in that circumstance to stand up in the Parliament and do what he did? Well, what he did was stand up in the Parliament and say there will be an investigation and that if Ms Holgate didn't want to stand aside while that investigation took place, she should go. Now, she did stand aside. That was the appropriate thing to do. It was pretty do. aggressive. You acknowledge that. It, it was very strong and I think it reflected the sentiment at the time. It reflected the tone of the questions asked by Labor senators in estimates, which revealed this expenditure. It reflected the tone of the question that Anthony Albanese asked as opposition leader to the Prime Minister in question time and indeed Mr <coughs> Albanese's statement that Christine Holgate's position was untenable before she decided to resign. So no need for an apology, Katie Gallagher? Well, I think there is a need for an apology uh, and I think the difference with what James has just said is in relation to the previous... Uh, Chief Executive of the Australia Post. He wasn't summarily sacked on the floor of Parliament in broad daylight on national TV without the benefit of any investigation. The investigation came later. The investigation essentially cleared Miss Holgate. Uh, and I think what we saw from the Prime Minister that day is what happens, and we've seen it a few times now, is when he gets challenged, when he gets under pressure, he gets angry, he overshoots. Uh, and I think Ms Holgate deserves an apology. And I say that having said, and Labor has acknowledged, that we didn't think it was appropriate that Cartier watches be given as bonuses to those executives. Um, and that was uncovered at Senate estimates. But the treatment of her since then has been appalling. And the fact that it ended up with her in front of a Senate committee having to kind of give her side of the story goes to show just how broken down the relationship became between the government and 
a senior official of a GBE managed by shareholders of government ministers. So you're saying the Prime Minister should apologise. What did he do that Anthony Albanese didn't do? Well, the Prime Minister... No one forced the Prime Minister to say she has to go... She should leave, she should stand aside, and if she doesn't, she should go in an angry, aggressive manner in question time. Now, Anthony Albanese said there should be consequences for the... Cartier watches and we're not walking away from that. We think they should. We don't think they should have been given. And he said her position has come, become untenable and it has become untenable when you've got the chief shareholder, Prime Minister, on the floor of the Parliament saying she's got to go. I don't know how you would come back from that. I don't think there is a world where someone in that position could come back once the confidence of the Prime Minister's clearly been lost. So Vicky Shu, does it look like bullying to you when the Prime Minister stands up on the floor of the Parliament and does that? Well, it certainly does, and I agree with Katie that I think an apology is old. And Why? I think Why? Well, the prime minister has ha the prime minister has half said it. You know, he regrets that you know um, Christine is treated in such a way. But from what I can see, it's a half apology, and from what I can see, you know, the way she's fi she's essentially fired on the parliament floor. It is. It is not fair treatment, due process wasn't given to her and, you know, from my perspective, as <clears throat> some kind of an outsider, I think this country prides itself in, you know, having due process, in treating people fairly and I think because of that, yes. It's true, isn't it, Senator Patterson? There was no due process for Christine Holgate in that circumstance. I don't agree. There was an independent inquiry and I disagree with Katie's characterisation of it. It didn't exonerate Christine Holgate. It found that her expenditure on these watches was inappropriate use of taxpayers' money. Um, it didn't find that she was guilty of fraud or anything like that. But, but, but she what wasn't was the due process when the PM stood up and said what he said? Well, I think he was reflecting how a lot of Australians feel, and I think it's appropriate... But that's a different thing to due process, isn't it? No, well, I think it's appropriate that the Prime Minister reflect the way Australians feel. They look to him as their leader to, um, to demonstrate he understands how they feel about these issues. I think he was right to do so. There was an independent inquiry. It did find issues with her management of Australia Post, and particularly expenditure of the executive team. It wasn't just watches, but there were other instances publicly reported of inappropriate spending. But is that the problem uh, with politics today, is that leaders reflect the population rather than lead it and actually create an example? <laughs> Undoubtedly, you want politicians to lead, but you also don't want politicians to be out of touch and to be cold to the sentiment of the Australian people. We're democratically elected and we have to understand and represent the people that send us there. And I think it's dangerous if we, if we turn ourselves into contemptuous about it. David Olson is a business executive. Did it look like due process to you? Well, I, th I thought the whole process was, was very disappointing. You know, we're, we're, we're living in a, in a world at the moment where there are so many tensions, problems and issues. And to look at our national parliament and see this sort of behaviour taking place is extremely disappointing. It's not setting an example for us in the world and we need to do better, frankly. You know, I... I you know, I, I hesitated to say this before, but I, I think this is a case of workplace bullying. You know, there's a lot of issues that are being addressed here. There are gender issues, there are governance issues, there are political issues. <coughs> it's a cauldron. Are you talking about the Prime Minister? I'm talking about the issue around Christine Holgate broadly, the, the way it came up, the way it was dealt with, um, and the process around, around the whole thing. And I think, I think none of us would expect our senior political leaders to treat an issue like this in the way in which it was done. You know, where's the civility? I think there could have been a far better process to take this outside the scope of the, fo the floor of the House and, and deal with it more appropriately. Would it be acceptable in a corporate environment? No, absolutely not. You know, <laughs> but, you know the public, public, uh, the private sector has, has nailed this. You know, we, we understand what a workplace environment should look like. We have rules and processes and most businesses now, if, if they're not compliant, they have a process to rectify it. I don't see that process you know, being implemented right now in the Houses of Parliament. All right, our next question comes from Ross Kroger. <laughs> Ross Kroger. Christine Holgate says she offered to resign, but that offer was not formally accepted by the board. Ms Holgate, in using feminist reasons, undermines the feminist mantra. Made in hindsight claims are only effective in court cases. Did she claim feminist privilege or recognition when she earned the appointment from the same board? Norman Swan. Um, I, I just think that's 
you know, with all due respect to Spurious question, that um, the, you know, you're litigating sort of my, relatively minor details, in my view, of the issue. The issue is a much bigger one than that. Um, I mean, I think that the, um, it shows, with due respect to both parties, ignorance of how corporate Australia works. If these people had got bonuses in cash to the same effect for the work that they'd done to getting external uh, funding uh, investment into Australia Post, saving 5,000 jobs, um, there would be no fuss. But it happens that the money was trans you know, it was put into watches. And I think relitigating the details of the ins and outs of what she said and what he said doesn't help that much. Is that the core of this is an injustice and also, I think, ignorance of how corporate the corporate world works. W was there a gender dimension to this, though? Yes, I think so. Katie Gallagher? Yes, I think so. Well, what was it? Um, well, I think we've seen the Prime Minister <coughs> protect a lot of um, male ministers when they've become under pressure, when they've had scandals, when there's been problems. Um, he's, you know, gone right out on a line to protect them and I think... Christine Holgate was thrown under a bus pretty quickly. And I think you've got to remember the context where this all happened. It was happening uh, in the same week that we had the Leppington Triangle $30 million land um, wrought scandal um, uncovered at estimates as well. So there was already pressure on the Prime Minister on a number of fronts. And I think he took the opportunity and he saw her as a disposable kind of item to to go out and um, say, well, you know, I'm standing up on this one while I'm not doing anything about all these things. But and are you saying he take, the Prime Minister takes a different approach to defending male individuals well, I think that's, versus females? I think that's what we've seen in recent months. I, I don't think there's any question about that. I don't think there's any question that the Prime Minister has a problem with how he deals with women or understands issues as they relate to women. I think that's been clearly established in the last couple of months. And Christine Holgate certainly feels that as someone who's been on the receiving end of the Prime Minister's wrath. And that happened in a very public way and she's clearly been quite traumatised by it. James Patterson. One of the people who has advanced the argument that this is bullying and that it's gendered is the former Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull. Um, but I remember his reaction when Ahmed Fahour's salary was revealed and it was very similar to Scott Morrison's reaction. Um, he went out very hard and said it was a totally inappropriate amount of money and it was a disgrace that taxpayers' money it was being given to a senior public servant in, the, in this quantum. So I don't accept the, the argument that this is gendered. And I also don't agree with Norman that uh, there's no difference between giving someone a $5,000 bonus and giving them a $5,000 watch. The difference is that if you gave most Australians $5,000, they wouldn't wander down to Cartier and buy themselves a watch. They'd pay off their mortgage or they'd give it to their kids. Um, there is something inherent about giving a luxury item of jewellery to someone as a reward for people who are already very highly paid public servants. And what about Katie Gallagher's point that this is a Prime Minister that approaches defending males differently to females? Well, I, I don't think that's the case. There have been female ministers in his government who've been under great criticism and scrutiny who have been... He has stood by, just as he has stood by male ministers. I don't think there's a difference. Katie? No, I don't agree. I mean, Bridget McKenzie was sacked, effectively. Uh, she's the only minister that's been sacked in this government uh, and she was sacked over sports rorts, which the Prime Minister had his hands all over. So, you know, I think he has found uh, opportunity to get rid of, you know, for political convenience. I think he has. And, again, you know, history... Uh, the last couple of months when we've had all this focus on, on women, we've had a Prime Minister telling us, you know, we're, we attend a rally, we're lucky we didn't get shot. We've got him... <laughs> you know, saying he can only understand things in terms of um, seeing it through the eyes of his daughters. He's saying he didn't understand the issues around sexual violence and sexual assault and how pervasive it was in our community. I mean, this is a Prime Minister who's got a problem with women. And I think Christine Holgate is another example. Right, let's take our next question tonight. It's on a topic you've shown a huge amount of interest in this week. The first question on it comes from Jessica Patty. I'm a healthcare worker and have been offered the AstraZeneca vaccine. On paper, I am all for vaccines and have advocated for the COVID vaccine in conversations amongst friends. However, I find myself feeling hesitant about receiving it. I'm especially concerned about potential effects on fertility as I hope to have more children. The recent incidence of blood clots in younger people has strengthened these feelings of hesitation. What's to say that there won't be more long-term side effects revealed over time 
Can I afford to wait a little bit longer to watch what happens in other countries, especially given Australia's relatively low prevalence of the virus? Norman Swan. So, um, vaccine hesitancy as opposed to being an anti-vaxxer is entirely understandable and the, your, your concerns are rational, so they're not irrational at all. So let's pick it off one by one. Um, there, th th it was put about for a while that there was a problem likely with fertility with these vaccines um, because at some point there was a theoretical cross-reaction with a placental antibody or something like that. And there's no evidence of that. If that had been the case, um, there would have been more problems early on with, um, with miscarriages, for example, and there hadn't been those cases, even though there hasn't been a trial in pregnant women. <clears throat> It's true that as time goes on, you can find out long-term long -term effects. Um, the, the reality with these vaccines is that they've actually been approved at round about the same point of study as most other vaccines have been in the past. It's just that it's all happened quickly because there have been so many people able to be recruited to trials. The, the clots, so, but the 780 million people have been immunised now. So it's a lot of vaccines out there, albeit in a short space of time. So th the problem that has emerged is this clotting problem with Astra. And I think that if you're under 50, you've got to give it some serious consideration. And potentially today there's a third, a third case. And, um, and, then, and I think people don't understand why the, the, they came to the conclusion they did. And there's two moving parts here. One is we're in a, a country, three moving parts, we're in a country that doesn't have any COVID effectively apart from it's coming in. We've, as you get younger, your risk of dying of COVID diminishes quite rapidly. But also the risk from the vaccine seems to go up. And where the balance seems to lie is around about the age of 50. So you are well under 50. So for you in a country where there's not much COVID around, if you're uncomfortable about that risk, which is probably around about one in 200,000, you should wait and wait until you can get the Pfizer vaccine or the Nova vaccine or one of the others. There's no rush for somebody like you. I get a lot of questions from people who are healthcare workers who are in their 30s and say, well, why can't I have the Astra vaccine? I know the risks, I'm prepared to take it. And that's a rational position too, because the risks are incredibly low. And if you want to, you know, if you want to get protected and feel comfortable, go ahead and have it. My gripe is that there should be Pfizer available for you now as a young healthcare worker. I just want to bring Senator Patterson in on that. Why isn't there Pfizer available for a young healthcare worker now? Well, there will be very soon, but like everyone else in the world, <laughs> we're scrambling to get as much vaccines as we can. There's only about 10 countries in the world that have sovereign manufacturing capability for vaccines. We're one of them. And so far, we've been producing AstraZeneca domestically. We haven't been producing Pfizer domestically, although that's a possibility down the track. So every other country in the world, the 180 other countries in the world, are just trying to get as much vaccine as they can and they're reliant on imports. Can I just pick and up on that? Are you saying that we should be manufacturing the mRNA vaccines here? I'm saying it should be looked at and it will be looked at. And if it's possible, I'm sure we'll do it. At the moment, the capacity that we've got... Why isn't it already got, being looked at? Well, uh, th these things are being examined on a, on a daily, hourly basis, Hamish. Um, at a moment, the capacity we've got with CSL in Melbourne is to produce AstraZeneca vaccine. Sure. But CSL has publicly said, in fact, before the COVID committee that Katie and I sit on, that they're open uh, to, vac to seeing if they can ma manufacture other vaccines. There's different technologies involved, different capabilities involved. It's not a straightforward thing to do. We so let's flick a switch, the, but it is possible. It takes the facts are minute, isn't it? that Pfizer knocked on the door of the government last June saying, what do you want? When do you want it? There was a meeting, and I'm not sure what happened at it, on the 10th of July, and a deal wasn't done until the end of November. What happened in those four or five months when Britain was doing deals with Pfizer, America was doing deals with Pfizer, and other countries were too? We didn't. And so we came to the party late when Pfizer had already committed its doses. So we could have had Pfizer, but we chose clearly not to. Well, just in response to that, we already have some doses of Pfizer. They've already been administered to Australians, so it's inaccurate to say we don't have it. But we're still we giving have, it to secured... aged care who don't need it. They could have Astra safely and be very effectively covered, and we're still going to aged care. And young healthcare workers, are, we're not saving every Pfizer dose for young healthcare workers at the moment. 
we, we have secured 40 million doses of Pfizer, which will be available throughout this year. Uh, but it is understandable why other countries who have suffered much more widespread community transmission than us are prioritising vaccinating their own populations with, that, with vaccines like Pfizer rather than allowing them to be exported. I'm disappointed that the European Union has blocked uh, exports of AstraZeneca, but as it turned out, uh, it's the Pfizer vaccine uh, which will be more useful for younger Australians, and they will be tended to be vaccinated much later than older Australians anyway. So, But, but why, uh, are, we not, why are we arrives, not prioritising the Pfizer that we have have here now for people like Jessica? The, the people most at risk of dying from COVID are older Australians. And, and Pfizer Astro protects them really well. If you let me finish, Norman, the, the Pfizer vaccine uh, can be given uh, to people 21 days apart, the first and second dose. The AstraZeneca vaccine has to be given to people 12 weeks apart. And so if you're an elderly person in a nursing home, we want to get you protected as soon as possible. So it is quicker to protect you with Pfizer than it is AstraZeneca. And that's the reason why it's still being deployed there. OK, I just want to bring in uh, another person from our audience, Jared. Uh, you're an aged care worker, is that right? Yes, I am. And how old are you? I'm 20. And how has it been getting information and access to the vaccine? Um, the information I've got has pretty much been non-existent. Um, and it's, I know it's really hard for me and some of my colleagues who we watch, we watch press conferences all the time with the Prime Minister and the Chief Medical Officer who are constantly saying, we're getting vaccines out to everybody who needs them. But I know myself and many people who are in phase 1A and six weeks later, I still had no notification of when I would be eligible to get a vaccine. So you've, I think, had now one dose of yes. Astra? Yes. So I, after I was notified by my manager that they had been told um, that they still don't know when they're getting the vaccines, it was suggested to us, everybody who worked in my home, that we go out and book an appointment with our GP or at a vaccination hub, so that's what I did. OK. And do you know when you're getting your second one? Um, well, I've got, I've got it booked in for, I think, in about 10 weeks now. But do you want to get it, <laughs> given the advice on AstraZeneca for people under I don't know. 50? I'm still undecided. This is very confusing, Norman Swan. Uh, yeah, so the, the problem here is, and this is independent of party politics, the Commonwealth Government never runs anything in health. Mm. So you can't press a button and stuff happens. It's the states where you can press a button. They don't control general practitioners or independent practitioners. And, um, and you, but, so what they did was they commissioned private organisations to go into aged care homes. And bizarrely, they go into aged care homes and they don't immunise the aged care workers. They're told to go and see their GP. Mm. You know, my view is you need 20 Israelis in here to run you know, vaccination <laughs> and you know, turn on a sixpence. <laughs> Just for context, for those watching, Israel has done a pretty phenomenal job at the rollout of the vaccine, right? Yeah, I mean, it's a, slight, it's a facetious comment, but the, nonetheless, the, the problem is we haven't been flexible. We haven't been agile, and the Commonwealth, and, and I do believe this is political, the Commonwealth has been running, telling states what to do, organising the vaccines, procuring... The Commonwealth, again, independent of party politics, are, is not good at procurement. And states are. If the, if the Commonwealth procured drugs at the same price as states managed to get it, we'd save about $1.3 billion a year. Same for medical devices. So we're, we, you know, procurement has been a failure here, really, apart from the Astra vaccine where we're producing it locally. Vicky, you're clearly under 50. How would you feel about getting the AstraZeneca vaccine? <laughs> Well, for me, because I'm not uh, a healthcare worker and I'm mostly just writing my book at home, um, so I'm happy to wait. Yeah. Um, and do you find the way this is all unfolding, the information, the communication around this, do you find it confusing or do you find it clear? Um, from my perspective, you know, it's, it's clear our government committed to bet on the wrong vaccine put most of the eggs in one basket and we are slower than most you know developed countries but given that australian has done a pretty good job with lockdowns and there are not a lot of community cases um, going around the community anymore i think i feel relatively safe to okay. wait a little bit longer 
So, Katie Gallagher, Labor has, is making a lot of noise about the vaccine rollout. Mm -hmm. What would you be doing differently if you were doing this? It's a phenomenally difficult task. Well, I think there's a couple of things. So, from, uh, I think, early last year when negotiations started, Labor was urging the government to have... Uh, get as many deals as they could in place back in the early days of the vaccine. So have a diversified vaccination strategy to begin with. Don't put all your eggs in the AstraZeneca basket, which is, aside from um, the the relatively small deal they had with Pfizer, which they've now doubled, uh, was where all the effort went. Um, and we'd been certainly urging them uh, that. Before the committee, we'd been told many times there was no need for that. Our vaccine strategy was fine. It was going to meet the needs of the, the community. It's turned out that's not the case, clearly. Um, look, and I think the other issue we've got is um, how the government, and I agree a lot with what Norman said. I was a former uh, health minister in a state jurisdiction or a territory jurisdiction, so I get the fact that the Commonwealth it does not tend to be very good at delivering services on the ground. Uh, and they have taken a decision very early on that they would assume responsibility for aged care, disability services and run uh, the program through GPs and with a bit of assistance from the states that would be enough. Clearly that has failed. Um, they set themselves targets of 4 million by the end of March, everyone vaccinated by the end of October, then it got wound back to a one shot by the end of October. Then it was get our aged care done in six weeks. Clearly, that's not the case. We have no idea what's happening in disability services. So I think confidence in the program from the public has been challenged because every promise the government's made has not been delivered. Um, and that is a problem as well. Um, now, we've had the, the Prime Minister come out and blame the states that they're stockpiling... Um, vaccine and not distributing it fast enough. Um, so we've seen this before where the blame tries to get shifted and now we're going to have two national cabinets a week and that's going to solve everything. Well, clearly um, the Commonwealth has failed um, and we need a lot better effort because if the vaccine rollout fails, then the economic recovery fails on top of putting vulnerable populations and the health of our population at risk. And that's not good enough. And the Prime Minister has promised things and he's not delivered. Hamish, Caddy admitted some... Hamish, uh, Katie has admitted some other advice that the Lab Party has offered the government on vaccines, which we didn't take up, and it's a good thing we didn't follow their advice. In a radio interview last week and another one this week, Anthony Albanese said the Australian government should have bought the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, and it was a disgrace that we hadn't done so. Well, actually, the expert medical advice we received at the time was that we shouldn't get it because it was very similar to the AstraZeneca vaccine, and not less than 24 hours after Anthony Albanese did that second interview, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine in America was poor in its rollout because of blood clots. There is a real danger in following politicians' advice and commentators' advice and ignoring the expert medical advice. What we did about a year ago, when we didn't even know whether vaccines would able to be produced successfully, let alone three or four of them, was bet on a range of different vaccines with a range of different technologies. Mm. Traditional technologies like sure. AstraZeneca, new technologies like Pfizer, uh, protein-based vaccines. Can we just be clear vaccines. and honest about this? It's not going well currently, no. is it? It's not. Hamish, we're in a global pandemic, right? So we're going to encounter some challenges. Sure. Um, and actually, I think if, if you look at the health outcomes in Australia or the economic outcomes that Caddy's mentioned, we are leading the world. We've had some of the fewest infections, the fewest deaths, it, so the best economic that, that's recovery. That's incontrovertible. Oh, How, however, thank you. another good example of poor procurement is this extra 20 million do do doses of Pfizer. Pfizer is going to be only too happy to give us whatever we want towards the end of this year because they're not going to be immunising in, 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 uh, in the United States. And they've got no deal with Moderna. The issue at the end of this year are going to be the South African variant and the Brazilian variant. And what we need to be buying is vaccine that's designed for the new variants. And the leading vaccine for that is Moderna. So what the Prime Minister should have stood up and said last week was, we're, we are negotiating to buy 50 million doses of Moderna and so that we've got a variant vaccine. And the Commonwealth is not focusing on the variants. Well, I don't think that's fair. And there are ongoing conversations with Moderna, as you would expect, and there should be. But the Novavax vaccine, which is in uh, its, its trial still, but looking promising, is a similar style vaccine to the Moderna vaccine and no, may offer some similar benefits. It's not. I'm sorry to correct you. It's a protein-based vaccine, whereas the Moderna is an mRNA similar to Pfizer. So the Novavax is a novel vaccine 
very different and it will be a very good vaccine, but it's not designed for the variant yet. David Olson, the argument is being put that Australia has been ahead of the rest of the world in its handling of COVID, but we'll fall behind, won't we, if we don't get the rollout right of the vaccine? Well, it, I think we, we, we've been very fortunate that we've not had to push this forward, you know, because we've closed the borders and we've had the luxury of time to be able to assess what are the best options. And obviously there's a debate about what are those options. But, you know, <coughs> he's often said there's not a race to get this, this done and, and get vaccinated. But the reality is in a global environment, it is a race. Mm. There are nations around the world now that are getting towards herd immunity. We've got, what, 32 million vaccinated in the UK, 100 million in the United States. And guess what? People are jumping on planes again and they're getting out and they're doing business. They're talking to people around the world. And we, we mustn't forget that part of our economic recovery is not only having a good, healthy economy here, but also our ability to be able to connect to the important markets that are going to sustain our growth in the future. So, you know, I, I think we, we need, from a business perspective, a degree of certainty around when these vaccinations are going to come into effect and then the corridors that will allow, allow us to travel more freely and uh, right. certainly around that. Let's take our next question. It's a video from Mark Horrocks. If people under 50 have a choice of what vaccination they get, why can't people over 50 also have a choice? Dr Chen from Atagi has said that they respect patient autonomy and patient choice. I have a genetic predisposition to blood clotting and a history of clotting, and I'm very worried about taking the AstraZeneca vaccination. Norman Swan, that's fair enough, isn't it? Um, so patient autonomy is appropriate, but the, uh, uh, appropriate here, but the problem is that I don't think there's any country in the world where you've got a choice at this, mo at this moment. You're taking what you're offered. My son in Washington got the Johnson vaccine, and um, so there isn't any choice at the moment. Now, you can always choose not to have it. What I will say that's mildly reassuring is that the, um, the, none of the people who have, uh, to my knowledge, who've been reported with this very unusual clotting syndrome have had a predisposition to clotting, unless you've had a very unusual syndrome called heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, thromb thrombotic thrombocytopenia. So, and you, you do have to take advice from your own doctor. Mm. But at the bottom line is that if you really wanted to, you could wait to, towards the end of the year and maybe you'll be able to get the Pfizer vaccine. But there's no guarantee of that at the moment because there's going to be a lot of people. There's over 12 million Australians who are going to need the Pfizer vaccine. Um, and, uh, you know, if you're older and you've got medical problems, get the Astra vaccine is my strong advice. I'll get it um, and I'll be happy to get it um, because... You, you know, the risk is incredibly low. All right, let's take our next question on a different topic. It's a video from Drew Pravlu. David, you first became the president of the Australia-China Business Council in November 2019. You accepted that role knowing the Chinese government was building concentration camps for Uyghurs and other Muslim ethnic minority groups in Xinjiang. Scholarly estimates put the number detained based on their Muslim faith at more than one million. The BBC has shown that rape and torture are systematic within these camps. The AP has shown the Chinese regime is suppressing the Uyghur birth rate with forced abortions and forced sterilizations. This all meets the definition of genocide under international law. So my question to you is simple. How in good conscience can you continue to advocate business with China while this terrible genocide takes place? David Olson. Thanks, Drew. Well, look, it's really a very difficult question to be able to, to answer that clearly. You know, the issues that we're seeing in Xinjiang um, are shocking and you know the problem we have at the moment is we don't have journalists on the ground we have very little direct information about what's happening there now i think most of us would genuinely and genuinely believe that you know there are serious issues that need to be addressed our government has looked at this um, it's not used the same language of genocide that other governments have used around the world uh, in recent times the uk um, canada parliaments have recently passed specific legislation using that term genocide Australian government has decided not to use that language, but have, have condemned uh, in very clear terms what's going on in those nations. Do, do you believe it's genocide? I don't... I haven't... Genocide is a, is a, is a, is a technical term uh, that needs to be defined it, under... It is a technical term, but the US Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, says it's exactly the right description. Right. It, it, is, it is a term that, you know, is, is clearly something that, you know, we need to be really concerned about in terms of what, what is actually going on there. Mm. You know, I'm, what I'm more concerned about is the fact that we just need to get verify the information first of all, and I don't believe that there's much that we need to, 
to prove, but we do need to get people in there. The United Nations have said that they, they are in close discussions now with the Chinese government to allow free and unfettered access to the Xinjiang province to review that. I think that's a really helpful uh, sign. In the meantime, I think the most important thing we can be doing uh, is to continue to advocate the principles that we believe in around human rights. Uh, I'm not law. sure if I'm clear on your answer to that. Vicky Xu, mm -hmm. is, is it genocide in Xinjiang? Um, the US government, the government in the Netherlands and Canada have all recognised um, the Uyghur crisis to be genocide. Now, Australia is in the unfortunate company of Turkey. Australia and Turkey are the only two countries in the world that have had a vote to decide if this is genocide and decided no. And so my personal belief is Australian has decided not to call this genocide, not because the crimes are not severe enough, but because economic considerations. So I think the question really is, how much do we Australians want to stand up for our beliefs? How much do we want to stand up for our values? And And at what cost? Because um, as some of the audience here would know that I have been enduring uh, the smear campaign for a month. The Chinese state has called me a female demon um, for writing about forced labor in Xinjiang and generally in China. So for business, um, the problem is, right, um, the Chinese state is facilitating, arranging a forced labor scheme targeting Uyghurs. And as a result, businesses have been implicated, supply chains have been implicated. And when businesses are trying to move out of China or trying to steer clear of forced labor, when they make promises to the world, to their consumers, that they will be ethical, they face backlash in China. So businesses, if they want to respect, if they want to adhere to, adhere to international law, modern slavery law in their own countries, they could not operate in China. So that, that's the situation we're in now. Uh, just on the personal story you mentioned, what has happened to you over the last month or so? I was lynched in the Chinese media, along with a lot of <coughs> the peers who study Xinjiang. Um, Your name was like top trending on the Chinese version of Twitter for a while. Yeah. Um, so last year, a year ago, um, last March, <coughs> and me and my colleagues at the Australian Strategic Policy Institute and our colleagues from the Washington Post Beijing Bureau, we did a collaboration. We wrote about forced labor um, and went to a Nike factory and identified on um, forced labor um, clues. And we wrote a report and named 83 brands that um, have been implicated with forced labor in their supply chains. And a year later, because there has been legislations, there has been um, companies pulling out of China. So now the Chinese government, in an attempt to rescue its reputation, to defend its actions regarding Xinjiang, and has decided to go on the offensive, and they've done two things. The first is encouraging and partially facilitating popular protests in China to um, endorse Xinjiang cotton, which has now become a symbol of uh, Uyghur forced labor. And two, a smear campaign targeting people like myself. Um, my other colleagues who do work on Xinjiang have been accused of rape. And I have been called so many names, and last night when um, you know I was eating at a Chinese restaurant with a friend, I felt uneasy, and I was being stared at, and you know, um, it's a difficult time. You're being followed here, um, or monitored. In the past um, eight months, um, people close to me who still live in China um, have been targeted by Chinese intelligence. Um, operatives, um, people close to me have been interrogated, repeatedly detained. They're paying a price for me to tell the truth here. Okay. So if the truth is that it's genocide, uh, James Patterson, why don't we call it that? 
Well, Hamish, I was banned from visiting China in part because I've been outspoken about these issues. Um, so, do, so do you call it genocide? I, I, I think it's very hard to look at Vicky's research and the research for her former colleagues at ASPE or Human Rights Watch or any of these other groups that have done it and conclude anything else. The reason why the Australian government hasn't declared it is not because of um, some judgment about trade or economics. It's because the Australian government has a long-standing policy that a genocide declaration is a legal declaration and a court should do that, not, not governments and not politicians. Um, but I'm happy to say um, it, it sure looks like it to me. So, why, is it, why is it hard for our foreign minister to say that, though? Well, well, to be fair, our foreign minister's been one of the most outspoken foreign ministers internationally on these issues, and she's called for the UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights to have access to Xinjiang so that they can collect evidence to help uh, make this determination. And the Chinese government's unwillingness uh, to allow them in uh, speaks volumes, as does, frankly, the campaign of harassment they've launched against Vicky and her colleagues internationally. Uh, why on earth would you do that if you didn't have something to hide? David Austin, how do you respond to this? Well, I think it's shocking in terms of, you know, what's happened to Vicky and her colleagues, you know, that it's, it's disgraceful. Um, one, one of the problems we've got is I think Ch China is, you know, undertaking a propaganda campaign around the world that's, you know, completely misjudged, you know, w w global sentiment around these issues. Um, the, the exercise the other day with the Chinese ambassador, uh, who's a very bright chap and, um, you know... A, a You're referring to a press conference that was held where they zoomed in... Uh, people from Xinjiang. That's right. You know, he was clearly you know, on instructions to represent the Chinese case for that, but it completely misread, you know, the mood of the Australian public and, you know, the broader community. And I think it's done nothing but, you know, you know further polarise views uh, around the issue. Um, and I don't... And unfortunately, that's made it very hard to have a sensible conversation about this. And I think the, the issue is fairly clear-cut as to how we need to act. But so I want to bring in a question from Ali Ramazani, who's in the studio audience. It always seems to be about how China is a big bully, putting Uyghurs in detention camps, how China is undemocratic, and how China wants money. But it's never about how China is leading the world in climate action, how China has achieved one of the greatest economic miracles, how China has one of the greatest cultures of all, and how China is helping its people. No country is perfect. Australia has many bad qualities itself, sometimes worse than China. But while we are beating China up over their bad qualities, much of the world doesn't recognize ours. My question is that can Australia ever create an authentic relationship with China if we only judge them based on their bad qualities and Western propaganda? Judging them on Western propaganda, was and it? And bad qualities. OK, Vicky. Um, Australia and the rest of the world have tried to engage with China for the last two decades, and much of that has been successful. We have overlooked the, the plight of Tibetans. We have overlooked the plight of Falun Gong practitioners. This is not China's first rodeo to, for, you know, mass attention and mass surveillance programs. This is not the first time. Um, we, the China-Australia relationship is at, this, at the place, at the state right now, right now, not because Australia has been hypocritical, not because Australia has been overly critical, but because domestically China has sunk into a place that's, I would argue, at its worst since the 80s when China opened up to the rest of the world. So one clue is 2018, our president, the Chinese president, um, made himself, changed the constitution, made, us, made himself president for life. 2019, in the article he wrote himself, he openly opposed the idea of judicial independence. And all of that, plus, re-education camps and genocide. I really don't think we're being overly critical. I think the world has had enough. David, David Olson, do you, do you think it's all, all China's fault? I'm sorry, Hamish. Do you believe it's all China's fault? No, it's not all China's fault. Uh, you know, Ch China's done some extraordinary things that we, you know, that Ali talked about there. That uh, we, we need to congratulate China for. That it's brought people out of poverty. It's you know created new ways of thinking about you know the world, the future. It's created a new new 
development models that it's trying to promote you know, as a better way of engaging global, the global economy. I think we need to give full credit for all of that. The, the, the issue, though, is... So, so is there some China bashing that's going on in Australia right now? Do no, you think? there's a huge amount of China bashing, and uh, it's, you know, unfortunately, a lot of that, as I said before, I think is, is partly be delivered by, you know, poor tactics on the part of China. You know, they've misread how to engage with the global community on these issues. I think the, the degree of self-confidence that China has, uh, its ambitions um, are now of such a level that they're creating concern around the world, uh, both from a security perspective, but also in terms of you know, the values um, uh, and, and our own values as to whether we feel comfortable about managing all of that. Katie Gallagher, some parts of the Labor Party find it difficult to be critical of China. Why is that? Uh, well, I don't know what you're referring to there, Hamish, Well, on the left of the party, there's some caution about taking on China as human <coughs> rights. Well, um, we've certainly condemned um, China where there is evidence of human rights abuses. Um, Penny Wong's been very strong on that. I think in relation to the Uyghurs, um, you know, and the, the shocking... Um, uh, images that have been, we've seen through the media, uh, certainly we have said repeatedly that, that we don't think um, that that's the act of a responsible global uh, power. Um, I think... Um, Do you think it's genocide? Well, I, I think it w the opposition would be helped if the government um, was clear about the assessment that they have and the information they have. I mean, from opposition, uh, we have credible media reports and other commentary, uh, but we aren't necessarily privy to all of the information that the government would have through their intelligence and other diplomatic um, services. So I think from our point of view, we think the government should be upfront with the Australian people about the information they have of, and the assessment they have of what's occurring in China. Um, and we would urge them um, to, you know, to be clear about that. Um, but certainly, I so think... So Labor just can't take its own clear position on genocide? Well, I think... Well, <laughs> no, to be fair... Uh, to be fair, I mean, the opposition doesn't have access to the information that the government has. Um, we don't. We have credible media reports of abuse of human rights, violations of human rights, and we have condemned that. We think... Australia's position on this would be assisted by the government being clear about what information they have, what assessment they have made, um, and sharing that more openly. We don't have access to that. I think a responsible opposition needs that information. We can't just operate on media reports. Norman Swan, we've been in this situation now with the relationship with China deteriorating for some years, but very clearly uh, much more so over the last 12 months. How does this get solved? How does it, how does it get fixed? by united action amongst countries. I think we made a mistake going out alone asking for the investigation into COVID-19 and focusing solely on China. That should have been a cooperative arrangement diplomatically with other countries and it would have had more force. Now we've got adults in the State Department in the United States. Tony Blinken's family grew up under the shadow of the Holocaust. It is so, when you hear these stories of the Uyghur and you hear you know, territory being created in the South China Sea, um, you, you just can't help thinking about the 1930s and appeasement. And yes, China is this great cultural nation going back thousands of years, but Germany was the home of Goethe and Bach mm. and, you know, great culture. Mm. Um, so. And you... <laughs> and it doesn't mean that you hate the... Ch I mean, I, I agree, there's been a lot of, um, I think, quite racist... Thing, racist commentary going on about China, but it's not to do with the Chinese people, it's to do with the Chinese regime. And I just don't think we can afford to appease, we need, but we need a united front so that little Australia doesn't get victimised in this and it's a moral position because today it's the Uyghur, who is it tomorrow? There's a lot of people in Australia, though... <laughs> Impacted by this, and I want to introduce you to businessman Tony Tan. You're an entrepreneur, I think. What do you What do you do? What do you make? Uh, we're in sustainability products with okay. silicone. And what are you working on at the moment? Um, so my company, Silfresh, has a very exciting um, partnership with the CSIRO, um, and basically we've created a, a technology-based paint um, that is, you know, anti-pathogenic and kills um, uh, viruses like COVID-19. Um, but we've really struggled, uh, I guess, to 
you know, get it out there. And so in terms of funding and what you get offered here, mm -hmm. um, how does that compare with what you are offered to, to go and do all of this in China? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think we're a great example of how Australia has really failed in, you know, bringing up uh, innovative companies like myself. Um, you know, if we look at, you know, the Chinese government, um, in the West, we always talk about how China is stealing our jobs, how China is stealing our IP, stealing our um, technology. But you know what? No one is talking about how China is, you know, genuinely and honestly, you know, encouraging the transfer of IP uh, from places like Australia to China. So how are they doing that? How, how are they inducing you to take... <laughs> Your IP to China. Yeah, yeah. So they, they're actually doing it through R&D grant programs as well as um, through, uh, you know, investors that they support. And um, the example of us really is them, you know, we've gotten offers from, um, you know, the Chinese city government um, to, you know, of, of over $100,000 to take our, you know, national science agency technology over to China and commercialise it, whilst I can't even get $10,000 from the ATO cash flow boost here. So you can see how there is complete, you know, discord between what China is offering companies like mine and what the Australian government and the Australian ecosystem is. Senator Patterson. Well, the reason why we talk about the Chinese government stealing our intellectual property is because they do. Um, they do it through a range of different means. Um, they, they do it through cyber espionage. They do it through cultivating researchers individually. They do it through uh, literally uh, registering patents of intellectual property that was funded by Australian taxpayers through the Australian Research Council. And the conditions of the grant of the ARC are that you can't register your intellectual property anywhere else. So they do steal our intellectual property. They've been doing it for decades. But you're not saying they are in this instance. Well, I don't know about that instance. I yeah. can't comment on that. Um, but uh, to your broader point, um, yes, we absolutely have to do more to encourage self-reliance and self-sufficiency in Australia. That's one of the lessons of the pandemic. And it's one of the lessons of the campaign of economic coercion that China is waging against us right now. Um, before this, let's just be straight because I, I just want to deal with Tony's point here. Yep. Is this an example of economic coercion? I mean, what's wrong with what's going on? Oh, now? I've got no idea about. I don't have anywhere near yeah. sufficient information to make that judgment. Not on the face of it of what you've told me. No, I'm not suggesting that. And you don't have um, a problem with what's happening. I mean, it, 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 presumably you would prefer this to be staying in Australia. Yeah, a, a, an entrepreneur who receives an attractive offer from somewhere else in the world is absolutely entitled to take that up. I'll be the last person to tell you not to take that up. But as a country, we have to do better to make sure that we can produce more of these technologies here in Australia. And what I was going to say, the campaign of economic coercion has taught us is that before this all hit, when I went to talk to business leaders about this and I said maybe diversification is a bit of a good idea, um, they thought that was a very strange proposition. Um, now they come to me and say, we need to do a bit more to diversify our trade. Um, and that's a, that's a really positive development. But there is a double standard uh, here, that we, we don't get anxious about Australian companies and they go by the legion. We, we spend government money, taxpayer money, developing Australian companies, high technology companies, and they end up on the NASDAQ in Los Angeles or New York. So we're losing our IP to the United mm. States every day of the week mm. um, because of an inadequate uh, investment environment here. And so I think, I mean, putting aside the issue of intellectual property theft, which I think is a clear issue here, is what China's doing is what America does, is it, it, it provides gold to uh, companies that need it to survive. And they, have, they go offshore and we lose them to America and we lose them to China. We may lose uh, secrets too, and we're not, we're not disputing that, but I do think there's a double standard here. You know, we only gave uh, the University of Queensland five million bucks to start off you know, the, the initial grant where they were the most promising vaccine out of, you know, in, out of five vaccines internationally, vaccine technologies, and our government only gave $5 million to them to start development. They relied on money from BHP to actually get going before they got a more substantial grant. We are, we are not good as a nation at trusting our companies and investing them and taking risks. Germany bought a, vaccine, a third of a vaccine company and injected tens of millions of dollars of euros to actually help CureVac get going. We didn't. OK, let's take our next question. It comes from Gian Chandaputra. Thank you, Hamish. 
I came to Australia over a decade ago as an international student, and I've settled here permanently ever since. Now, international education as a sector is our fourth uh, largest uh, export, and it supports around 250,000 jobs. Now, given that around 30% of uh, enrollments come from China, uh, the sector can also act as a potential ballast to our reliance on exporting iron ore to the country. Now, the trouble is that the sector is facing right now, obviously with vaccination delays, that will, have, uh, that will jeopardize the easing of our border restrictions. So my question is, what is our plan uh, to bring international students back uh, without uh, taking away spots of ho in hotel quarantine from returning Australians? Katie Gallagher. Well, this is an issue we've been looking at in the COVID committee over the past uh, year or so. And I think the first issue is the Commonwealth has failed to outline a national quarantine plan. Um, they had a review done by Jane Holton. It had a number of recommendations. Um, I think everyone openly acknowledges that the Commonwealth, again, has responsibility for quarantine. They've devolved a lot of that to the states. Um, but certainly we think the Commonwealth could have done more and should be looking at how they are going to manage quarantine in the event that we have our international borders closed for some time and there's a difference of opinion about how long those borders may be shut. Um, you know, certainly Deloitte Access Economics, they said 2024. Um, airlines are having a more optimistic um, approach to that and thinking later this year. Um, Minister Hunt said just because you get vaccinated doesn't mean the international borders open. So there's a bit of confusion about what will happen on internet with that international borders uh, being shut. Um, but I think um, certainly the universities are under pressure, you know, through their funding arrangements. They have supplemented their income through international students. That has been removed and I've met with a few unis that are really struggling around that. We've had international students stuck here, often with no support because they weren't eligible for any of the COVID support. We've had people return home halfway through their studies who can't come back. So there's a big issue here, Hamish. But how it's would you fix of, it? How would you well, get them back it's, in? Well, again, it's one for the government uh, to manage and they have to come back with a plan. Like, this is part of the issue with the Commonwealth's response to COVID is the lack of transparency and the lack of information is leading to confusion and that is bad for the economy, <coughs> uh, but it's also bad for the thousands of students and the universities that rely on um, that those students to come and support uh, their university and the work they do. So again, this is something the Commonwealth has, has failed at again. Um, when we look at things, the COVID Save Act, aged at care, this? universities, you know, the list goes on. Well, the, the international education sector is one of the most significant you know, export earners for us. Uh, and I think we have underestimated just how important that is to our economy. It's not just the, you know, for the, the students coming in and the travel and everything that goes with it, but it's also the, the capacity to be able to work, study, use these students to be our international ambassadors uh, as they go back to their home countries in, the, in due course. But we, we do need to reopen the economy as soon as we can to get as many of these students back. The international education sector, I think, is going to change quite dramatically. But what do you mean by as soon as we can? Like well, it's all going to be, it, it's going to be limited by our capacity from a health mm. perspective to be able to get people in through the ground and our capacity to be able to put them through you know, hotel quarantine yeah, or whatever, quarantine. having regard to the various other competing needs for other people to come back through that system, including not just the returning travellers you know, or people that are stuck overseas, but also business people who need to be able to get on tra planes and travel more frequently. Vicky Shu? Do you, do you think we'll ever see the same number of students, for example, coming from China that we did pre-pandemic? Oh, I doubt it, but I think it is a really great opportunity for Australia also to rethink, you know, what are we doing with, with international students? And I mean, as a former international student, you know, there is this common sentiment that we're here to study, but we're also paying really high prices and treated like cash cows. And during the pandemic, the students felt like they had been failed by the Australian mm. government. And they're caught in the middle when China and Australia are having all these disputes. You know, um, I don't think the numbers will recover. And I think we do, there are so many questions around that that have been 
put on pause, for example, again, IP theft, for example, influence operations from the student communities. Um, and when international students do come back, we need to reassess all of that. All right. Well, that is all we've got time for tonight. A huge thanks to our wonderful panel, Vicky Shu, James Patterson, David Olson, Katie Gallagher and Dr Norman Swan. Please thank all of them. And thanks to those of you here in the studio. Great to see so many of you back in the studio. And thank you also for wearing your masks. Hopefully, hopefully that won't be forever. Uh, next week, we're in Sydney talking about all the big issues of the week, including Australia's climate policy on the global stage. We'll be joined by the former Prime Minister, Malcolm Turnbull. He'll be here on the panel. We'll see you then. Good night.